Hello everybody, my name is Walter in this episode 21 of my Redstone Component series. In this episode I want to cover the 1.20 update and a few things I missed in previous episodes. So let's get started. In episode 13 I talked about rails and minecarts and here I missed that diagonally powered and activated rails will also create block updates in a diagonal fashion. So this piston here is but powered now and you can see it reacts when I activate in this activator rail down there or this power rail here. Same obviously when depowering the entire thing. Next in episode 20 I talked about the 1.19 update and here specifically about the boat with chest and here I missed that if you put the boat on top of a half slab the hitbox will actually reach into the next space above so you can have a total of 33 hoppers going into that boat with a chest and not only 21 as I said in the previous episode. Next two minor changes that were introduced since the last update but didn't really make it into their own episode. In 1.19.3 the spawning conditions for endermen, skeletons and wither skeletons in the nether dimension was changed again. They will now spawn at light level 7 and below. And in 1.19.4 the jukebox got a bit of an upgrade and now will interact with hoppers and droppers. So you can now use hoppers and droppers to put this in there and also hoppers to pull them out again. Which makes for automated setups to sort discs. Well, for the most part since with the 1.20 update we got another new disc and now since there is a limited amount of signal strength you can create with that, uh, they had to double up a bit with the slot number 14. Nevertheless, the jukebox is now a rather interesting component for Redstone circuitry, and not only because of the new functionality, but also because it's a unique combination of attributes. So it's a full block, it redirects wire, so somewhat similar to a target block, but it's also immovable. And as I said, it is a bit of a container, so with a comparator, you can use it to create a given signal strength. And also while the jukebox is running, it will output a signal strength of 15, directly, not via comparator, but directly, which means this can also be used a bit as a timer. And with that, let's start with the 1.20 update. Here I'll start with the quality of life changes. So first of all, we have two new wood types, bamboo and cherry. Now bamboo itself is not really new, but now it can be crafted into a bamboo block, which can be used as any other wood type. So you can craft things like buttons, pressure plates, doors, trap doors, fence gates, and so on. The timings involved are the same as with other wood types, but since uh, bamboo is very fast growing and can be easily harvested with flying machines, this is a great alternative to more traditional tree farms and wood farms. On the other hand, we have the cherry tree, which is again just a new wood type, a bit different color, texture, and so on, but again the same behavior as other wood types. They can be found in the new biome Cherry Grove and uh, the only real thing of note is that the leaves have this nice particle animation going on. So this might be something for you if you want to give your builds a bit of an ambience. Connected to the cherry tree we have the pink petals which can be found on the ground. They can be bone mealed and can be crafted into pink dye. Uh, they primarily can be used as decoration. Somewhat connected to the new wood types, we have now a new type of wooden sign, the so-called hanging sign. Um, this comes in different variations depending on how it is connected to its surroundings. So if it's on the side of a full block, you have this bar on top. If it's on the bottom of a full block, it's just connected directly. If it's uh, below something that is not a full block, it has this triangular chain there and can be also put at different angles, as you can see here. The interesting part here is while the width of the text is smaller than for a normal sign, it can actually have signs or text on both sides of the sign. And the way to get text onto both sides has to do with the final change, which is uh, that you can now reinteract with signs. So let me show this. So let's put down a sign with a one on one side. And you can see the second side is empty, but if I right click on it, 
I now get, go back into edit mode and I can now edit the back side of the sign. If I don't want that, I can lock a sign using a honeycomb similar to waxing a copper block. And now I can click on this here and nothing happens. So science got quite a bit of an upgrade with that. Uh, so uh, if you have a typo in there, you don't have to break the entire sign and redo it, uh, which is very nice. As you can see, I work quite commonly with science and this is really a lifesaver sometimes. And the last of those quality of life changes is that now the space in between a bookshelf and an enchanting table can have certain blocks in between without the connection being broken. So things like lichen, flowers, torches, and so on will no longer stop the connection going in between the two. Next up, we have two minor changes to redstone. The first is an additional functionality of the notebook, and also we now have a new head for the piglin. But uh, the new functionality is that if you place a head on top of a notebook, you actually, when you activate the notebook, either by clicking or powering it, hear the corresponding mob sound. Mm -hmm. And using uh, data packs, you could actually customize this even further. This can, for example, be used for a rather simple jump scare, like this here. So if you have seen this uh, going on on certain servers in recent times, uh, this is how you can do that. Furthermore, we now have a so-called chiseled bookshelf, which allows you to actually interact with it and store books. And that works for a multitude of books. So you can use normal books, you can use book and quill, you can use enchanted books and also knowledge books, which uh, are only really available through the commands. Um, yeah. But this chiseled bookshelf, as you can see, interacts with wherever I'm clicking on it. And it will also interact with comparator, so you will get a signal strength corresponding to how many books you have in there. It will also interact with hoppers and droppers, uh, so this could be used as a kind of book filter, so to filter books out of a stream, for example. Next up, we have sky sensors and shriekers, which got a bit of an upgrade. So first of all, you can now waterlock them, which will silence them. So if you had problems with your traps being detected due to the noise of the sensor, now you can get around that. The sensors also have a slightly changed timing, so they still have a range of 8 meters, but now are turned on for one and a half seconds and have a cooldown of half a second. Due to water not mixing well with comparators, they can also be connected now to a comparator through a full block, similarly to containers and things like item frames and similar. A new functionality is that you can now use an emphasis block to chain sensors together. So what happens is if you have an emesis block next to a sensor and that sensor is triggered, then the emesis block will emit the same frequencies, which can then be taken up by other sky sensors in the vicinity after the corresponding travel time, obviously. So as an example, I am too far away from this sky sensor to detect me. But if I get in a range of this sky sensor here, I'm even further away, but you can see this Skag sensor over there gets triggered via this Skag sensor and the corresponding emesis block. Very, very useful. What you also could see is that the Skag sensor will now strongly power the block right below it, if it's a full block, obviously only, um, which might be useful, as you can see here, if you're working with the mine. So that's the normal Skag sensor. Now we got a new variation on the Skag sensor, which is the calibrated Skag sensor. The calibrated Skag sensor can be crafted out of a normal one with the emesis charts. And it has on one side an input. And well, let's start with what happens if there is nothing with the input. Then it will work like a normal Skag sensor with just twice the range, so 60 meters, and a third of the signal duration, so just half a second. I can see it will trigger, half a second later it turns off again. Now, if I give it a signal strength into this input port, the behavior changes. Now it will only detect frequencies 
of that signal strength. So now at the moment it's one. So walking will activate it. Jumping will not. Or placing a block or whatever. By the way, they also changed uh, which frequency does what. Um, now it's more in categories like uh, moving around, interacting, uh, using items and so on. But I was with that. So one, walking does. Anything else does not interact. If I now set this to two, walking no longer triggers, but jumping does. And if I set this to three, something else will interact with that, but not walking or jumping. And that's how this works. Also a minor change is now that the signal strength you get out of this is not corresponding to the frequency, but to how close you are. The further away you are, the weaker the signal strength becomes. The closer you are, the stronger the signal strength becomes. And that's pretty much all about the strike sensors. And with that, we are more or less leaving the actual redstone components and are getting to the more miscellaneous stuff, which is just slightly related. Uh, first of all, we have two new mobs. So first of all, we have the camel, which is a rideable mob you can find in the desert or breed via cacti. Uh, if you put a saddle on them, you can just use them like a horse. They are a bit slow. Um, they have a sprint animation and they can be a bit stubborn if they sit down. A bit more interesting is the sniffer, an ancient mob. And this can be it gets a bit tricky to get, actually, because you won't find them spawning in the world. You will first have to find a sniffer egg using archaeology in a warm ocean ruin, which is within warm ocean biomes. And once you have one of those, you can put it down, wait a couple minutes, and then it will hatch into a sniffer. Uh, as first a small sniffer, and then later on a bigger sniffer. Once you have one of them, or a couple of them, you can start breeding them with torch flower seeds. Now, torch flower seeds are also interesting because you will also not find them lying around. To get them, and also to get the seeds of the pitcher plant, which are the pitcher pot, you will have to first have a sniffer. The sniffer will look in things like dirt and sniff out occasionally new things, like those seeds. It will remember the 20 last places it tried to sniff something out and will not go there anymore or will not use that space. So you will have to give it enough space so it can well, start sniffing around. But once you have those torch flower seeds, you can start breeding them. Uh, the pitcher plant and torch flower um, can't be gotten any other way. You can't also really bone meal them because once they are grown up and you pick them, you get the flower and no seeds. So the only reliable way to get more of them is a sniffer. And with that, let's continue to archaeology. Now, archaeology is a new game mechanic that was introduced with 1.20. And there are some close connections to the new structure the trail ruins. So let's start with the trail ruins. They are a structure you can find buried underground with just the top of the tower sticking out of the surface. Um, from the tower there is a single path with a couple of rooms to the side. All of that is filled in with things like gravel. Uh, the structure itself is built out of uh, mud bricks, terracotta and glazed terracotta for the most part. And using archaeology you can find things like specific armor trims, pottery shards, and also a new music disc, which is just called Relic, which has a signal strength of 14 if you put it in shoebox. And this is also the first music disc, which is reusing the slot of another one. So now we have two music discs with uh, signal strength 14, which makes sorting them again a bit more tricky. Now, with that covered, let's talk about actual archaeology here. So the tool to use here is the brush. The brush can be created out of a feather, a copper ingot, and a stick. And once you have one, you need to find either suspicious sand or suspicious gravel. Suspicious gravel can be found in the trail ruins, 
Suspicious sand can be found, for example, in warm ocean ruins, and in those ruins you can find, for example, snifex. So what you need to do is get one of those brushes and then start brushing. And if it's a naturally generated one and not one I've placed manually, there is a loot table involved and you can get, depending on the location, a random item. And once that is done, the suspicious sand or gravel turns into normal sand or gravel. That's at least the idea. What you can from that, as I said, depends on where you are. But usually it's things like, well, trash items, it can be pottery shirts, it can be armor trims, sniffer eggs, and so on. Now, I already talked about or mentioned pottery shirts. Those are parts that, if you have four of them, can be to put together to a decorated pot. Uh, all you need to do is uh, get yourself those shirts and then put them in a corresponding pattern and depending on where they are in this pattern you get a unique shirt or a unique uh, decorated pot with a different orientation or position of the different things there are in total 20 different shirts so uh, you have a total of 160,000 different combinations for those decorated pots. So you can get quite creative with that. And that brings me to the last part for today, which are smithing templates. Those are consumables that are for the most part used to decorate armor, with one rather important exception. They can be rarely found in chests or suspicious sand and gravel in various structures or even dropped by certain mobs. If you want an overview, there is a good one in the wiki. Link for that in the description. Fortunately, you don't have to find every single template you're going to use. You can actually make copies of ones you already have. So you will still have to find the first one, but after that, you can make copies. The way this works is you need a crafting bench, then the template, then a material which depends on the template you want to copy, and seven diamonds. And if you put them in this pattern here in the crafting table, you get a copy of that template. That's how you get a copy. So once you have one, you can make as many copies of as you want. Just make sure that you don't use up the last one you have. So that's a rather annoying uh, accident if that happens. What material you're going to use or going to need depends on the template itself. You can see this in here or in the wiki. So a few need uh, metal rack, some need cobblestone or mossy cobblestone. Then we have one for sandstone, four with uh, terracotta, two with um, deep slate or copper deep slate to be more precise. This is prismarine. Then we have blackstone, endstone, and the purple block. But as I said, uh, there is a nice little table in the wiki. Now, before I get to the actual armor trims, let's talk about the netherite upgrade template. This is the one everyone will want to have. You can find them more or less naturally generated in bastion remnants, or you can make copies as I already explained. How to use them is pretty simple. You need the upgrade template. You need a diamond sword weapon uh, well, weapon, uh, armor, or tool, and you will need a netherite ingot. And then all you need to do is put them in the smithing table, and you have your, in this case, netherite sword. And that's already how you use them. Pretty simple. And um, in a sense, it's less expensive than before, since you only need one ingot, but uh, on the other hand, you will need uh, the template. So. Not sure if it's an upgrade or a downgrade. And with that, let's actually talk about the armor trims. So there are 16 in total, as you can see here, found in various locations and through various occasions. And uh, the way they are used is basically you need the template, you're going to need an armor piece, which can be diamond, leather, uh, or so on. And then you need a material which determines the color of the trim later on. So you have 
10 different colors, 16 patterns, so 160 different possible combinations of color and pattern. And um, well, for this example, I'll go with, oh, let's say, yeah, why not? Let it write again. So let's put that in there. And now I have a chest plate here and I could put this on me and now I have a armor piece that looks a bit more interesting than a plain one from before. And with that, we have reached the end of this episode about the 1.20 update. I hope you enjoyed it and well, see ya.